How to build a simple function generator will be treated in this video. A function generator is very useful to test electronic circuits by generating different types of electrical waveforms over a wide range of frequencies. The most common waveforms are square, sawtooth, triangular or sine wave shapes. The central element of the function generator used here is an active integrator. There is negative feedback provided by the capacitor, hence the potentials at the inverting and the non-inverting inputs are held equal by the operational amplifier as demonstrated in the video about those devices. The non-inverting input is connected to ground, while the inverting input is connected to the input terminal of the circuit through resistor number 1. If the input clamp is connected to ground, the difference in potential between the inverting and the non-inverting input is 0V, hence the resulting output voltage of the operational amplifier is 0V too. Both plates of the capacitor are at the same potential. Furthermore, both sides of the resistor are at the same potential, hence no current is running through the device and the state of the circuit is stable. If the input clamp of the circuit is connected to the positive supply voltage, the capacitor gets charged via resistor 1. Now, the potential at the inverting input would increase, but due to the negative feedback, the voltage at the output clamp of the operational amplifier is decreasing in such a way, that the potential at the inverting input is kept at the same potential as that of the non-inverting input, which is the ground level. While the left side of resistor 1 is connected to the positive supply voltage and the right side is kept at ground potential by the operational amplifier, the voltage drop across the device and so the current through resistor 1 and the capacitor is constant. This results in a linear relationship between the voltage across the capacitor and the time passing by. Remember that the current and the capacitance are constant values. The circuit performs the mathematical operation of integration. The correlations are explained in more detail on the project page. To keep the inverting input at ground level, the output voltage of the operational amplifier is counterbalancing the increasing potential across the capacitor, which is why the output voltage equals the voltage across the capacitor, except the sign. Like expected, the oscilloscope plot shows a falling straight line. When doubling the resistance, the slope of the straight line gets halved, whereas tripling the resistance results in a slope of just one third. Same goes for the capacitance of the coupling capacitor. The output voltage of the operational amplifier can't exceed the input voltage, hence after a fixed span of time the negative supply voltage is reached. If the input clamp of the circuit is connected to the negative supply voltage, the capacitor gets charged with reverse polarity. Now, the voltage at the output of the operational amplifier increases to keep the potential at the inverting input at ground level. The process stops when the positive supply voltage is reached. If the input voltage changes back to the positive supply voltage, the output voltage decreases until the negative supply voltage is reached again. The current through the resistor depends on the voltage drop across the device, hence on the difference in potential at the input terminals of the circuit. If the input voltage is half of the positive supply voltage, the slope of the straight line is halved, because the current running through the resistor is halved too. One third of the input voltage results in a slope of just one third of the primary slope, and so on. The input offset voltage of a non-ideal operational amplifier is different from zero, so even while the input clamp of the integrator circuit is connected to ground, the output voltage will decrease or increase very slightly, depending on the specifications of the real device. The intention is to get a triangular curve progression, so all we have to do is change the input voltage of the circuit from the positive to the negative supply voltage whenever the output voltage is close to the negative supply voltage and conversely change the input voltage from the negative to the positive supply voltage whenever the output voltage is close to the positive supply voltage. A circuit suitable for that is a Schmidt trigger. 
The output signal of the integrator is connected to the input terminal of the non-inverting Schmidt trigger. The output of the Schmidt trigger jumps to the positive supply voltage whenever the output of the integrator reaches the upper threshold. Now, the capacitor gets charged with reverse polarity until the output of the integrator reaches the lower threshold. The Schmidt trigger jumps to the negative supply voltage, which is why the output voltage of the integrator is increasing again. The potential of the two thresholds can be read at the oscilloscope plot. The yellow curve displays the curve progression at the output of the Schmidt trigger, while the green curve displays that at the input, which is identical to the output of the integrator. The next step is to insert four potentiometers, enabling the adjustment of some parameters. Potentiometer number 1 sets the lower and upper threshold of the Schmidt trigger, hence the level of the output curve can be adjusted by this device. The curve moves up and down when turning the potentiometer. By turning potentiometer number 2, the resistance ratio of the coupling network at the Schmidt trigger and so the amplitude of the signal is right. Potentiometer number 3 enables the adjustment of the frequency. As explained beforehand, the charging and discharging currents are higher the lower the resistance of potentiometer 3, hence the slope of the curve and so the frequency is increasing. The reference potential of the integrator is varied by potentiometer number 4. The output voltage of the Schmidt trigger is either the positive or the negative supply voltage. If the reference potential of the integrator is close to the positive supply voltage, while the output voltage of the Schmidt trigger is on high level, there is a low difference in potential between the input and the reference voltage, hence the current through the capacitor and so the slope of the output curve is low. In contrast, if the signal of the Schmidt trigger jumps to the negative supply voltage, there is a high difference in potential between the input and the reference potential at the integrator, hence the slope of the curve is high while the capacitor gets charged with reverse polarity. If the reference potential is adjusted to half the value of the difference between positive and negative supply voltage, which is ground in the previous examples, the curve progression is symmetrical. The frequency of the signal is also varied when turning the potentiometer. If the potentiometer is turned to the maximum position, the output signal is close to a sawtooth curve. A sawtooth signal is in principle a triangular signal with a relatively low linear ramp and a rapid fall at its end. By inserting another resistor and a diode, the fall time can be minimized. Resistor 1 and 6 are switched in parallel. By inserting a diode in series to resistor number 6, the total resistance of the combination depends on the polarity of the voltage. While the output voltage of the Schmidt trigger equals the negative supply voltage, the diode is reverse biased, hence the charging current of the capacitor runs through resistor 1. If the output voltage of the Schmidt trigger jumps to the positive supply voltage, the diode becomes forward biased, by which the current running through the capacitor is clearly higher while the device is charged with reverse polarity. The fall time of the signal is clearly lower than the rise time. R6 should be as low as possible, consider the maximum current of the operational amplifier. You remember the pulse width modulation circuit discussed in one of the previous videos? With the knowledge about the integrator discussed before, the working principle of this circuit should be easy to understand. Integrating a constant voltage with respect to time results in a straight line. Integrating a straight line with respect to time results in a quadratic function. A quadratic function is close to a sine wave when using appropriate parameters. The plot shows two quadratic functions that are as close as possible to the sine wave painted in blue. When switching two integrator circuits in series while the input of the first one is a square wave signal, we get an output voltage which is very similar to a sine wave. For many applications, this approximation is close enough.
While switched in series, the sine wave signal at the output of the second integrator drifts to either the positive or negative supply voltage. There is a feedback between the output of the first integrator and its input signal via the Schmidt trigger, but this feedback is missing at the second integrator. The small offset voltage and so the bias current running through the input of real operational amplifiers causes a drift of the signal. Furthermore, the triangular input signal is not perfect and any DC offset will accumulate in the capacitor over time. Trying to adjust the level of the triangular input signal to get a stable output signal won't succeed. A resistor can be added in parallel to the capacitor, hence there is a path for the DC current to flow. The resistance value should be as high as possible to minimize distortions caused by this device. Now, the level of the output signal can be adjusted by turning the potentiometer at the Schmidt trigger. By using a quad operational amplifier on a single chip, the whole circuit fits on a small board. While inserting several potentiometers, the shape of the signal, the level, the amplitude and the frequency of the output signal can be varied. The function generator is definitely not perfect. For example, whenever the amplitude of the triangular signal is right, the frequency of the output signal alters too. Whenever one parameter is right, the other parameters have to be readjusted. Nevertheless, the board is suitable for demonstration purposes. You can get the layout at the project page. The resistor and the capacitor of the integrator form a low pass filter. Hence, the amplitude of the signal varies with frequency. These effects can be observed at the sinusoidal signal at the output of the second integrator. The higher the frequency, the lower the amplitude. When swapping the capacitor and the resistor of the integrator, the resulting circuit is called active differentiator. The negative feedback loop is now provided by the resistor, while the capacitor is used at the input side. Caused by the negative feedback, the potential at the inverting input of the operational amplifier is kept at virtual ground, hence the input voltage equals the voltage across the capacitor, while the voltage across the resistor equals the output voltage, except the sign. The output voltage is proportional to the time derivative of the input, hence the circuit acts as a differentiator. The mathematical operation of differentiation is the opposite operation of integration. When using the triangular voltage as the input of the differentiator, the resulting curve is the square wave signal, which is the input at the integrator at the board. Using the sinus-like curve of the board as input of the differentiator, the resulting curve is triangular. You can see clear distortions, indicating that real circuits always add noise to a signal. That's all about function generators for today. Some more information is provided on the project page. Thanks for watching and I'll be back.